Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this week's Everton show. We hope you enjoyed your toffees free international break and that you're raring to go again even though we have to wait until Monday night for our latest reunion with David Moyes. On the sofa this week, Snods and I are joined, I'm delighted to say, by none other than Kevin Ratcliffe. Welcome to the Everton show Kev. First of all, international break, early September, it's too early surely. It is, um, you know, I've known him at the end of August and you know, even earlier than that, only by maybe a week or so. But uh, yeah, definitely too early for me. Um, you know, I think you could see that. I've been to the, the Wells Moldova game, and uh, you know, still lads. I mean, some of the lads hadn't played forty five minutes. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think uh, you know Ashley Williams. I think he'd had a ninety minutes, maybe what an hour and twenty minutes of football, if that. Um, I think Joe Ledley had only had forty five minutes. Um, so that the sort of Sort of sparse, I think. Robson Carnu hadn't played at all. He just mm. found himself a club. So it's a very difficult time for international managers. It's a shame because we were just getting our momentum going as well. There'll be plenty more chat, by the way, with snods and ratters during this week's programme. And we'll also bring you these charming people as well. We have organised an in vaccination campaign in Ivory Coast to vaccinate more than five thousand children because it's my first call up wasn't expecting to start or, you know but to be told I was starting the day before um, yeah it's really proud moment. I'm sure there'll be a, a few racing there's a really races and, and they've been welly thrown and everything else so no it's all about the, the patients and, and the, the adults. Body associates you as one of the great Everton number nine but you are the number seven for a few games. Well uh, Harry Cassock had decided that I wasn't playing very well and one of the motivations was to take the number nine shares off you. You know, it's going to be a tough game. It always is going up there. Monday night football as well. It'll be, it'll be nice to play underneath the floodlights, but you know, we won't be thinking too much about the, the, the people that have been here before. It's all about the people that are here now. And you know, we've had a pretty decent start, and we're desperate to, to keep uh, the ball rolling. Well, transfer deadline day wasn't quite the down-to-the-wire excitement that we all wanted, but the general consensus of opinion is that Everton's business during the latest window was quite good. The last piece of the summer jigsaw was Anna Valencia, who was with us initially, at least, on a season-long loan. This is Ronald Koeman's take on our latest acquisition. The reason was that he was already on, on our list, because I think it's, uh, it's a striker who had a lot of pace, uh, physically strong. He can play from the left, he can play from the right, he can be in a replacement for, for Lukaku. And that was good. And, 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 and overall, I think the, the, the transfer winner was positive. Of course, disappointed about uh, the situation around Sissoko on the last day. But OK, we did everything to, to get the player in. But OK, the player finally chose for a different option. And, and you, you need to accept that. Was that one of the attractions in, in bringing Enner on board? The fact that he can play across the forward line, he's, he's comfortable playing wide and through the middle? Yeah, it's okay. You, you always, as a manager, you like to have uh, players in your squad who can play on different positions. And, 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 and that's good because uh, we need that type of c competition between our strikers, but also between our midfield players and between our defenders. And then that's really the competition what you like and uh, what players need to give the best out uh, of themselves. What were the challenges in getting that deal signed and sealed on, on deadline day in terms of him being on the other side of the world in South America? Yeah, but OK, that's, that's always difficult. You know that, but uh, we had really a good contact. The agent and, 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 and the case between Everton and West Ham. And it was good to have the boy in. And, and OK, we're looking forward to when he's coming in. Yeah, the next step now clearly is, is get him here, get him training with, with the team and, and familiar with everyone. Yeah, he's, he's back this afternoon and, and OK, then uh, he's, he's coming in to train and, and he need to adapt to the to the, the new teammates. And But OK, everybody knows him, he knows the players and uh, that's not so difficult. 
as I said earlier, Snodds, the summer business overall was, was generally very good and, and a Valencia is the, the last piece of the jigsaw for now. Yeah, it was very important as well, that's to bring a striker in uh, because we... Ideally, we've only got Big Rom as a central centre forward. I know pre-season he tried Kevin Morales and Jerry Delafay as a as a partnership. So I think it's important that we do bring another striker in. Uh, it's important he gets back to the club and and meets the lads and gets to know the strength and weaknesses of as well. But not only that, as you said, uh, Ronald Koeman said he can play out wide as well if need be. So yeah, important uh, we got him in. And he knows the Premier League, of course. He certainly does. Uh, all right, weren't well, brilliant for him at West Ham, but hopefully it will be at Everton. We look forward to meeting Anna Valencia, that's for sure. Let's hear now from one of our earlier summer acquisitions, Yannick Balassi, who confirms that he's really settled in well to life at Everton Football Club, even though obviously it's been punctuated by international duty where he enjoyed a 4-1 win for Congo against the Central African Republic. Good result for us um, as a team and you know we needed a win or a draw to be honest, but it was good to get a win, especially in front of our crowd, you know, playing almost in front of 100,000 people. And, you know, a win for them and the country was, was good. That must be incredible playing in front of so many people. Yeah, you know, we get at training, to be honest, you know. Um, it's, it's a bit kind of normal because obviously I've been playing for three years now. So, you know, for all the new players that come, you know, it's almost like they're in shock because they can't believe how much people come and support the team. But, you know, um, we're a country that's passionate about football and I'm sure it's the same here at Everton, you know, with the fans. We see on your social media accounts that you, you definitely like to be a, a, among the people when you go over and, and sharing those excitements. Yeah, you know, obviously for myself, you know, um, going back to Congo, it's always a night opener. You know, it makes you um, appreciate the things that you got in life and you know, so to be amongst them and making other people feel happy, you know, um, makes me feel even better. I know you were born over here, but yeah. does that make a difference to them? No, I don't. I don't think so. You know, because obviously I can speak the language, and you know, my mum and dad are from there, and you know, I, I I do my all to to play for the shirt and the country and try to do the best every time I put on that shirt or step onto the field with them. So, you know, I think they've taken me as one of their own. I was going to ask you about the language. I know there's 242 languages in, in Democratic Republic of the Congo. I know yeah. four are official. Which do you speak? Uh, I speak um, Lingala, you know, um, one that um, Romelu speaks as well. So, Of course, that win over the Central African Republic yeah. uh, caps a fantastic qualifying campaign. Yeah, it's, it's been a good qualifying campaign for the team and for myself personally. You know, I just aim to, you know, keep up the sharpness and take it into the Everton game so um, fans and, you know, players can start seeing what I can really do. Decent sign in this boy, Kev. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, he's got the one thing that everybody wants and that's pace. And uh, I think you've seen when he's played against us in the past that he's caused us problems home and away. So, uh I've got a feeling it's going to be a good acquisition to the side. We're looking forward to seeing him, but while we've got you here, current Welsh captain Ashley Williams will be a great signing. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Yeah, he's he's one of them lads that doesn't really need to be bedded in too much. You know, he's got to settle in, but uh, he knows what uh, is required. And uh, you're getting a, a top player um, that's a ready-made player. Uh, you don't have to wait for things to happen. He's a leader, um, and I think you'll see, but he's a no-nonsense defender as well. But the big thing is he can play. Mm. He's a good acquisition, that's for sure, is Ashley Williams. Right, let's end part one with a really heartwarming story. Aruna Kone does an awful lot of work back in the Ivory Coast for people less fortunate than himself. There are many people in his homeland who require various vaccinations against disease, but they simply can't get access to them. So Aruna decided to step in and start a foundation that gives people the opportunity to get the medical treatment that they need. My foundation is, uh, is based in Ivory Coast, but uh, it's created in Holland in 2007. And now since 2008, we have organized a, a vaccination campaign in Ivory Coast to vaccinate more than 5,000 children in Ivory Coast. And some we give school kids to the children to go to the school. 
because I come from uh, the poor town, town in Ivory Coast. It's very important for me. It's not just back home that you've been helping. I know you quite like community projects, going into schools, meeting kids like these. Why is that important? Yeah, for me, it's a come here to look the children here is for give me a lot of experience to do a similar in Ivory Coast and I come here to to do this surprise and give some advice to, to the young here. For me it's very very important. I think it's the best way to help the children to to be better in the future. Nice story, that's an odds. Yeah, great story. Uh, he's got kids of his own as well. That's how important he is. Uh, he's got family of his own, so he, un he understands that helping young kids where he's from, and, and you can see in the, uh, in the clips there that he enjoys going in the community as well at Everton, so fair play to Aruna. Well done, Aruna Kone. Lovely story, and a lovely way to round off part one of this week's Everton show. After this short break, we'll be back with plenty more conversation from these two, and we'll meet a special Evertonian who celebrated a very special birthday recently. He was 100 years old. Welcome back to part two of this week's programme. We're about to hear now from two Evertonians with two very different tales to tell. Georgie Hacopian is a toffee from the United States who made his very first trip to Goodison Park for the game against Stoke City. And Jim Rogerson is an Evertonian who was born during the First World War, 1916 to be exact. We were delighted to meet up with both of them when we played Stoke City at Goodison Park recently. Our last home game against Stoke City was a sellout at Goodison Park. And among almost 40,000 fans inside the stadium were two supporters who showed perfectly the club's history and growing global appeal. The club invited Jim Rogerson to be their special guest, with a lifelong blue having turned 100 years old a few days before the game. Jim, a World War II veteran, made an appearance on the fan zone before meeting Ambassador Graham Sharp on the side of the pitch for a special presentation which included a framed programme from his first game back in 1928. Well, <laughs> the, same, the feeling's just the same, but there's one year on 90. There's, there's only one football team. Well, if Jim illustrated Everton's history and family appeal, then Georgie Hacopian from Los Angeles showed how Everton is growing its profile in the States. He caught the attention of fans on social media when he tweeted about how an Everton security guard had offered him a unique glimpse of the stadium after he learned that official tours weren't running because it was the day before the game. Yeah, I arrived in Liverpool Thursday uh, afternoon. I uh, grabbed a quick bite to eat and I uh, grabbed a cab to Goodison Park. There was nobody here. And uh, I kind of walked up to one of the, one of the guards and... I asked him, I said, uh, he asked me what do I, what, if, I can, if he can help me, and I said, yeah, I just wanted to take a look and see the outside of the stadium, and he said, don't worry, don't worry, mate, I'm going to take you, uh, give you a quick look around, and it was one of the most amazing things ever. The way people have treated me, the, the reaction people have given me, and uh, it's almost like I've known everybody here my whole life. That's how it feels. I feel like I've known everybody here, and um, I'm immediately a part of this family, and it's uh, unbelievable. Two very special Evertonians there, Kev. Two lovely stories. But the Evertonians have always backed the team, haven't they? The away support these days is second to none in the Premier League. And I suppose it was always the case. I, I think so. Um, yeah, you, you go away and the, the other end, or the, the end that you they had was, uh, was always chock-a-block. Um, down at Tottenham, you know, even if when we're playing Notts County, I remember Notts County in the mm -hmm. Cup, and I think, they had, I think we had three quarters of the ground. Um, it's just a great spur on it. It was just fantastic. It does, Kevin, in Europe, it does, it? if I can just interrupt there just one minute, it does help you as a player as well. When you go out there and you see that following when you're away from home, mm. it, it's fantastic because you know that there's travel, they, they want you to win, and it inspires you. Uh, uh, well, I think it's what something like are we fourth or best supported away side in the Premiership, or well, maybe fourth now, um, with Newcastle being relegated. Mm. But, you know, you, you've got Man United, Liverpool, um, and I think maybe Arsenal, I'm not too sure. And then us, ourselves. I mean, it's just fantastic. And it's been like that for a long, long time. Mm. You know, going back, I think, as far as I've been supporting them in the 70s, I always remember a good contingent of supporters. I think we've got a great London branch, um, which I think must hold thousands because a lot of them get a chance to see us when we're in London. I was going to say there before as well, especially in Europe, when we went to places like Sittard and Bratislava and, of course, Bayern Munich and then Rotterdam, 
the support was incredible. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to let people down then, isn't it? You know, you're going away. I mean, some great stories about the lads pre-season and obviously then against Sittard, I think it was, when, you know, supporter, naked supporter ran on the pitch and they, they let the dogs on him <laughs> and he was clinging to the fence, wasn't he, <laughs> at that time? So, uh, yeah, and that, that was that full side, you know, to think that that was uh, our first time in Europe for a number of years and mm. they wanted to make the most of it. So it was, it was great, great feeling. It was interesting you say the players really do take inspiration from it. Is that when you first run out and you get the roar and you think, our away fans are going to outsing the home fans, eh? It is, without a doubt, does. You, you come up from that tunnel and you look to where the Evertonians are going to be in, in the ground, the away ground, and uh, you see them in the mass numbers. And it's a, it's a great feeling when they're getting behind you as a team, uh, when, you get, when you're getting out there. And it, it does give you a, a lift before the actual kickoff of the game. I think it's what's the name as well when the, the new players come in. I don't think they realise no. about that, mm. um, the, the, how well supported a team like Everton is. And uh, I always remember Tony, Tony Cotty coming up and mm. we played. he played in his first derby game. I said, you just have a look how many Everton supporters are in the cop. And he couldn't believe it that there was about 2,000 in the cop. Mm. And I said, they were all. I said, make sure you score because there'll be another 2,000 <laughs> jumping up as well. <laughs> <laughs> but even the League Cup tie snods, your Barnsleys, your Reddings, your MK Dons. Frightening. Absolutely frightening. We went to Barnsley, does me and you, we did commentary there, and the, the stand, 5,000, Kev, yeah. they were, went to, and it was on Sky, yeah. it was on TV, yeah. and there's still 5,000. The there. hamburger I was over working, and uh, the, unbelievable how many, even in, just in front of you, mm. how many, not just in your own area. Even the pre-season friendly is absolutely unbelievable. Well, as you all know, the Paralympics are well underway in Brazil at the moment, and to celebrate the start of the Games, the Rice Lane Community Centre in Liverpool staged a very special event that enabled local people with varying disabilities to enjoy a fun afternoon of sporting recreation. We sent Graeme Sharp along to join in. a lot of fun. The whole plan was to have a big celebration for the Olympics and the Paralympic Games and to include our service users so to promote social inclusion. They don't get a lot of chance to do races or sports so today is all about them just having a go and having a bit of fun doing it. <laughs> Tried to keep it uh, Brazilian themed which is why we've got the Brazilian samba bands doing a bit of zumba. But yeah, it's a perfect day. I mean, the Paralympics just about to start, so it made sense for today to be that day. Well, it's just about getting the, 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 the adults out and enjoying themselves, you know, and in this day and age, and with the weather and everything else, we're, we're blessed with the weather today as well, so it's good to get them out in the, in the fresh air and, and have a little bit of competition. And a, a, I'm sure there'll be a, a few racing, there's really races, and, and there's been welly thrown and everything else. So, no, it's all about the, the, the patience and, and the, the adults, you know, it's, uh, it's important that. You know, we remember uh, they've got life as well, and it's great to see them out here enjoying themselves. Unfortunately, they will get excluded a lot of time from sports and games, um, so this is about them being able to just do whatever they want to do for today, having a bit of fun. And, you know, they're doing a lot of exercise without knowing it. Once that zumba starts, they'll be moving and dancing, and it is really good for their health. And it's great that obviously Graham, you know, a a person of his profile comes down to show his support and, and interact, have fun with, with everyone here. Well, it's good because a lot of our service users are sort of mid-30s mid to 50s, so they will remember that period of football. I'm doing the medals in the, in the presentation afterwards, but everybody, it's, it's not about winners, you know, everybody's enjoying themselves and so taking part, and that's the most important thing. I think the, uh, the carers do a fantastic job as well, but uh, this is this is a a facility that I wasn't aware of, you know, and as you said, it's a mile away from Goodison. Uh, obviously, it's great for them, as I said, and the most important thing is they enjoy themselves. Uh, and by the looks of the, some of the faces here, they're enjoying themselves, but they're competitive as well, and they want to win these races that are coming up. We've been together as a group since November, so this is our first major event. But with a little bit of publicity, um, you know, someone like Graham coming down, it's going to do wonders for us when it comes to applying for funding um, for sporting equipment or things like that. We've had to borrow a lot of this stuff today, but if we can get some money to, to buy our own, then there's no reason why things like this can't happen more often for us. Since yourself and Diamond and Sharpie became ambassadors, you've been out and about in the community to do many various things. That's another lovely story and uh, Sharpie seems to enjoy that. Yeah, nuts. he's fantastic. I'm, I'm going to have a go at him though. He's presenting medals and look at him, not shaven, 
unshaven does. I, I think, uh, yeah, I'm not happy with his appearance. He grows there, the beard every now and then, doesn't he? He does, he does. But He's always been a bit lazy. <laughs> you know I mean? uh, no, it's great. It's great to go out in the community. We, we were just talking about it. That it weren't so much in our day, was it, Kev? But now, Evan is unbelievable for in the community. And not only the first team lads and the ambassadors, but everybody seems involved. We've got massive staff on the community at Everton. And I, I think it's brilliant. You were saying the other day, Kevin, when we were speaking about your duties when you were a player, it was more looking after the lads. You had to be a real captain and even sort out the players' lounge passes. Our players' lounge was a, a nightmare every Friday, getting the stamp out and stamping them and making sure that <laughs> they were put in envelopes for something like Snod, who needed like 10. He was only getting three. Where was he going to get the other seven from? Um, and then putting them in. And, and I remember one week, I mean nightmare the, the ink had dried up and I couldn't so I had to write it all out that <laughs> what date it was because you couldn't get in that's could why you were the skipper oh, yeah, yeah. there was only one that could write in the <laughs> team I think. but no it was uh, yeah them type of duties come with the job you know sorting out tickets as well um, but it, more often than not you know in the community for us was actually going to hospitals and mm. sort of meeting people who maybe they had a serious car crash or seriously injured in some way or another um, and sort of really getting their hopes and everything up. Mm, lovely. We did a stadium tour earlier in the week, Snods, and we often lament over the fact that the players' lounge has changed so much over the years and the culture of the lads having a pass and the opposition players coming in for a beer afterwards has gone. Yeah, well, we start off with a tour like that because now it's, uh, it's the kids' crash for the players. Mm. Uh, there's not a drop of alcohol can be seen <laughs> in there. But uh, you're right, Kev used to uh, give the tickets out in, a, in an envelope and you used to have Ask the lads if they were going to be using him, if you, you could use it for a particular day. And we were quite strict as well. If you didn't have a ticket, Kev, they, they couldn't get well, in. We had Dave Ash on the door, <laughs> didn't we? We, we all had to chip in uh, a pound a week. So he got, I think it was 18 or 20, 20 pound a week, didn't he, to actually run the, the door on the lounge and nobody could come in. And we, uh, I think we were given something like a, a barrel and a half a game, wasn't it? Yeah. To, and the, we got our own optics in there and everything. <laughs> but we were talking about it, Kev, as well. The opposition used to come in and used mm. to mix after a game and talk to each other and yeah. discuss the game. And then they'd have a they'd have a crate of beer to take on their coach to for the home. All that's lost now in, in like mm. modern football. They don't even see each, see each other after a game. Basically, it's straight on the bus and straight off. I thought that were important in our time because you got to know the opposition a bit more respect, I suppose. Next time you met, we had friends as well. Mm. Sometimes that played for the opposition, you know, it's it's hard yeah. to sort of say, oh, you you know, your friends were at your football club, but you know, Man United, Clayton Batmore, right? Mark Hughes, you know, even Liverpool, wasn't it? Mm. We knew everybody at yeah. Liverpool mm. then because we were actually going away on international duty with them. Kev Sheedy was going with Ronnie Whelan, Sharpie was going with Stevie Nick, Sooness, mm. and Doug Leash, and that. So everybody knew each other. Be in the players' lounge, the good old days. And we're halfway there. That's it for part two, but don't go too far away because after another short break, we've got our big interview section of the show. And this week, it's the legend that is Joe Royal. And I can tell you, Big Joe is in top form. The word legend is bandied about with indecent regularity these days, in my opinion. A legendary status is bestowed upon a footballer or a manager well before it's really merited. But any Evertonian will tell you that our big interview guest this week suits the moniker perfectly. Even though he balks at the suggestion himself, Joe Royal is a cast iron Everton legend and it's always an immense pleasure to be in his company. Sit back and enjoy listening to Joe Royal. Yeah, Unzi and, and his boys have been terrific. Uh, you know, very well aided by John Ebrill. You know, they're a great crew together. We've just been sat in the office for about three hours talking football and saying how lucky we are still to be in a football environment. So there's no ego about the place, but Unzi's is a great coach and he's got a great future. And Johnny Ebb also, you know, they're great of affinity with the boys. And it's not like the old days when I was a kid, when everything was seemed to be built on fear and rollickings. It's all encouragement. We let Ryan Ledson go recently, Joe, to Oxford United and sometimes young players making a move like that, it suits everybody, doesn't it? Ourselves, the buying club and the boy himself. Well, it, it did and, and it will give young Ryan a, a chance to go on again. And I'm not saying he hasn't come on, but all of a sudden there are so many in front of him. You know, we've seen Liam Walsh, we've seen Tom Davis and Kieran Dowell in the first team, Benny Beningui coming up behind. 
Uh, we still have uh, Conor Grant, who's out on loan at Ipswich. So in midfield, we had a bit of a block developing and Oxford wanted to take him. So the logical thing is, if you can't see an immediate first team position or first team threat, and uh, Ronald's already seen him in, in training as well, you know, he, he's, he's given his, his say so for the lad to go. So he can go and try and make a career. We get a few bob back, you know, not a massive amount of money. We're heavily insured against him going on and taking the quantum leap somewhere else and ending up. So it, it, it fits all around more than anything. I saw Ryan all last season at Cambridge on loan uh, and he did very, very well. And he, he's got a chance now to take his, his career further, but he would have been blocked up if he'd stayed here. How much satisfaction do you get, Joe, from seeing a young boy who hasn't quite made the grade at Everton still go on to have a really good professional football career? Always do. You know, the, the, the hardest thing, when, when I was a manager, the hardest thing was telling young players that you couldn't see a future for them at Oldham Athletics, you know, to start with. And um, it, it still is a hard thing, but you have a nice smile. As long as it doesn't hurt the club, of course. I mean, as long as there's no big mistake, you know. The, but um, you know, like Sir John Lundstrom, who's gone to Oxford last year and has had a great time, you know, and done really well there, even talk about championships cl clubs looking at him. And w we don't feel that we've done anything wrong there, but we're certainly feeling very good that he has a future still in football. Good people. Who took you in the reserves, Joe, when you were playing for the Rezies? Oh, going back, my first um, reserve team manager was a fellow called Arthur Proudler. Um, I worked under Tommy Casey as well for a short time. But that was old school. That was in the days when um, coaches stood on the line and shouted abuse of players, <laughs> told them how bad they were, you know, and then came in and gave you a rollicking even if you won. So that was the old way. The new way is much better. But at least you got the chance to play at Goodison Park, didn't you? Well, I did, you know, and, and I played in some big games when I was 16. They, of course, the, the first team used to play, um, say we played Liverpool at Anfield. Well, those who couldn't get in at Anfield, which usually came to about ten to 13,000, came back to Goodison to watch to the reserve derby. And, um, and those games were, were great. 13,000 for a reserve game. Awesome. I can remember one particular game at Wolves where I played as a 16-year-old novice. Um, with maybe half a dozen, certainly five, maybe six internationals in the team. And Alex Scott came up to me before the game, and at, at this stage he was still Mr Scott, by the way, not Alex Scott, and said, uh, Joey said, I I'll threaten. I'll threaten to cross the ball so many times, but I won't until I hit the dead ball line. And don't come running too early, son, you know, or you'll be under the ball. Yes, Mr Scott, you know. And I didn't, and I waited and I waited, and he delivered, and I scored. And it was a smile, and sometimes you can learn more in a tip from a senior player or a bit of advice and help than, than you can in, a, in a, a month's coaching and training, you know, the experience of playing with people. In those days, Harry Catrick paid, I think, 40000 for an Irish international called Jimmy Hill just to play in the reserves and bring the young kids on. So he was very aware of, of how much an experienced person could do that. So Jimmy played regularly for Ireland and regularly for Everton Reserves, but sell them in the first team. Was there really that much reverence? Was it really Mr Scott and not Alex? I had to knock on the first team door and uh, take their socks in for them. <laughs> and particularly one or two, uh, Roy Vernon was always hard to deal with. You know, he'd inspect the socks. If they had any holes in, you know, you'd have them wrapped around the back of your head, go and get them sorted. No, I mean, it, it, wasn't, no, it, it wasn't really that hard. You know, it was part of the humour. But certainly, you had to knock on the door to go in as an apprentice. We were speaking the other day, Joe, about uh, a couple of games when you actually wore the number seven shirt. Now, everybody yeah. associates you as one of the great Everton number nines, but you wore the number seven for a few games. Well, Harry Catterick had decided that I wasn't playing very well. And one of the motivations was to take the number nine shirts off you. This is when you obviously didn't give a, you weren't given a number for the season. And so I played wide striker. I remember doing it against, I think it was Wolves and the game at Arsenal. And I played off the right uh, coming in. And that, it might have been David Johnson up front or it might have been Jimmy Husband up front. But I played the wider role instead of the central role. And it was all to make me hungry to get the number nine back. That was a, another kind of motivation. And it worked? Well, it, I was only three games, I think, number seven, you know, so uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it worked. Harry Cassidy was always very good with me. I mean, he has the, the reputation of this tyrant of the time, which a lot of the managers were. Bill Shankly was, Bill Nicholson was, you know, all these managers, the legendary managers. Um, Matt Busby was. If you speak to any United boys, you know, there was, he wasn't this soft, pipe-smoking Scotsman that everybody sees in the photos, you know, he, he was ruthless. So, but Harry was very good with me, you know, I, he, he was, if you were straight with Harry, he was straight with you. The game I saw on YouTube, you were number seven, Jimmy Husband was number nine, we had Henry Newton playing, uh, Tiger McLaughlin, but the start of the show again was Borley, who scored the only goal from 25 yards. We used to joke about it because uh, the Man of the Match award was usually done on a Friday afternoon before the game, <laughs> and it inevitably said Alan Ball, he was that good, believe me, he was that good. He could dictate a game, he could run a game, he could score a goal, he could motivate people. The worst loser you have ever seen. Boots flying around the dressing room, tears of anger, you know, uh, some, we used to sit there, I'm not going in the shower till he's calmed down. And, you know, I'm not having anything hit me on the back of the head or anything. So, no, Borley was a great man. And everybody who played with him would tell you, even if you go to Arsenal, the best player that they ever played with. Let's just finish with yourself, Joe. You're looking well. You've uh, you've had a hip operation. Yes, I've had my second hip operation to go with the two knee operations, and I do make a lot of noise in the airport. Now, when I go through that frame, everything goes off. I'm fine. I'm I'm up and about, back watching games again. So um, I'll be following the low knees around the country. We've got Conor Grant down at Ipswich. I made a mistake there. That's a, you get to Moscow quicker, but <laughs> you know, someone's got to do it, <laughs> and I love it. So I'll start with you. Lovely piece midway through that piece of film when Joe Royal said he had to knock on the dressing room door and off camera, you and Rats looked at each other and said, I had to do that. Yeah, that, that was the thing. But can I just say before we, we start that uh, I should dislike Joe Royal. He let me go from Everton Football Club when he took <laughs> over as manager, but how can you dislike him? He's, he's fantastic. I just said during his interview, you could listen to Joe all day. He's mm. a great fella. But yeah, just going back to that dressing room, I, I had my apprenticeship at Doncaster Rovers uh, in the old fourth division. There were a lot of experienced old pros there as well. And uh, thankfully, I only did one year. Uh, Billy Bremner signed me after my first year, usually to two year apprenticeship. But I was fortunate I only did one year. But I tell you what, you could not get in the first team dressing room unless you knocked. You could have the pots of tea that they'd ordered, the kit that they'd ordered, anything that the lads, but if that door was shut, you, you had to knock, you had to wait for a shout to come in and then you'd go in, do your, whatever you'd got to do, lay it down there, the tea, and walk straight back out. And as Kev says, you don't even look at them <laughs> because they'd have you for something. <laughs> Who'd be in the dressing room waiting for you then? Uh, Roger Kenyon, Dave Oof. Jones, Mickey Lyons, Bob Latchford, <laughs> George Wood, um, you name it, Andy King, giving his verbals. So it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was like, it's hard to say, you know, you got to knock on the door. And if you didn't, um, it was, you know, Whatever they could think of was your punishment, <laughs> and uh, hey, you can't do it now, no. can you? No. Didn't do you any harm, though, guys. I thought it? it was great. It was great. It was great. Uh, it, I'm, it, it I'm, made you a man. I'm a big believer in that. I know it's totally different now. Mm. You, 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 they don't do that, but you used to have to mop the floors, Kev, didn't you? Get all the kit ready, get do everything there. Mm. And like a club like Doncaster, we had to paint the stands in the summer, uh, just red emulsion all over the stands. So. Didn't get any time Thank off. Thank God we didn't have to do that again. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Still be there. Yeah. So, but no, he didn't. As I say, it didn't do me any harm. Didn't do any of the lads growing up. I thought I think it's a great idea. A lot of ex-players who I have the pleasure of spending time with say the same thing, Kev. It would do them no harm to go and paint the goalposts or, or look after the boots or the kit. You see them now. They walk down Finchfield. They go and see Jimmy or Sagey and get what they want. Well, the boots one's the big one. I can't yeah. understand that that they're, they're not cleaning boots or anything. Um, you know, that's, uh, I mean, the bonuses at Christmas were pretty good, yeah. really, and that obviously the, the way the wages have gone, they're even better. Um, but I, I don't think it does them any harm in putting, you know, kit out in the morning and taking kit away. But I think there's more on education now, isn't there? That, you know, as soon as training's finishing, you've got to go and do some education and, and that. And sometimes I wonder what's more important, the education mm. or the football. It, it seems as if the education sometimes is taking preference over the football. Whereas you could be kicking a ball about and learning a technique or working on your weaker foot or working on your heading. Um, and, and that's taken away from you because you've got to do classwork. 
Can just I just very quickly, yes or no? I met your dad during the week. If you went home with a pair of green boots, would he let you wear them? <laughs> green, I think I had white Alan Ball boots <laughs> once. <laughs> <laughs> Only lasted a week as white. <laughs> right, we're taking our third and final break of this week's programme right now. Watch these adverts, put the kettle on, or depending on what broadcast you're actually watching, you could even get yourself a beer from the fridge. In part four, we'll be looking ahead to the Monday night at the Stadium of Light. Welcome back to the fourth and final segment of this week's show. Now, as always during the international break, Everton were well represented at all age levels. From seniors down to juniors, the Blues had players in most of the home squads. In fact, we had two on duty for the Republic of Ireland under-21s, Harry Charsley and Courtney Doofus. We sat down with Courtney at Finch Farm when he got back and he confirmed that it had been a good experience. It's been a hard week. Um, you know, I've not been back from injury too long um, to go into two games in a week. Obviously the travelling takes out of you a bit as well, so it's been a tough but enjoyable week. Tell us about the two games then, obviously uh, a 2-0 home win against Slovenia and then a 3-2 loss away at Serbia. Yeah, I mean it's, it's a different uh, different type of game to what we'd usually play here in the under-23s. Um, it's a lot more physical, I'd say. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good experience at least. And, and two starts in, in both games, was that more than you was perhaps expecting? Yeah, definitely. I mean, because it's my first call-up, I wasn't expecting to start or, you know, but to be told I was starting the day before. Um, yeah, it was a really proud moment. You say it was perhaps a more physical style of football in the international under-21 setup. How did you find that? Was it easy to, to become accustomed to? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, it's, it's more my game, to be honest. I'm quite, yeah, a, perhaps suits yeah, you. quite a physical player. I mean, uh, I was up top of my own as well, which made it a lot harder. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it, all of it. And tell us a bit more about your background as well, Courtney, because you could play for three different countries. Yeah, I mean, I'm on my dad's side, um, my dad's parents are Jamaican. Um, and obviously I was born in England, but my mum's family, my mum's mum was from Ireland herself. Um, that's what makes me eligible to play for the Republic of Ireland, so. We call that boy Courtney O'Doofus now <laughs> down at Finch Farm. He'll be drinking Guinness from now on in. But it must be great for the young lads to go away and play against international footballers at their own age. Yeah, because they get comfortable when they're at the club, on uh, day in, day out, and without mixing with other pl uh, players from other teams and playing the international, international way as well. You get in a comfort zone in your club. Uh, and he's a great lad. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got time for Courtney. He's, uh, he always got time for us as well, and uh, he always asks how I think he's done after he's played and stuff like that. So I'm glad he's doing well, and uh, I hope he continues that form for uh, for Everton in the 23s. Move on to senior international football. Things haven't been better for for your lot for quite some time. <laughs> well, so it's been brilliant, hasn't it? I mean, a great summer. Um, took it on the other night as well, which is a sort of mm. difficult game mm. uh, wasn't quite sure you know 154th in the country Moldova were and we were 11th and we weren't quite sure but they they played like they were 154th in the, in the, in the world so uh, <laughs> yeah we got the result we deserved really a win's a win isn't it whoever yeah. the opponents are well we've got to wait until Monday night of course for our next Premier League match and it's a reunion night at Sunderland with David Moyes Stephen Pienaar Victor Nietzscheby and of course Jack Rodwell don't forget him and also a chance to lay the ghosts of our last visit to the Stadium of Light, a pretty dismal display back in May that brought the curtain down on the Everton reign of Roberto Martinez. Skipper Phil Jagielka is looking forward to going back to Wearside and putting the record straight. You know, it's going to be a tough game. It always is going up there. Monday night football as well. It'll be, it'll be nice to play underneath the floodlights, but you know, we won't be thinking too much about the, the, the people that have been here before. It's all about the people that are here now. And you know, we've had a pretty decent start and we're desperate to, to keep uh, the ball rolling. Pleased to see uh, David Moyes back in English football. Yeah, definitely. He did a fantastic job here. He probably didn't get the support that he was hoping for when he went to, to, to Man U, then decided to go abroad and, and have a little venture there. Uh, he's obviously took on a really uh, difficult job over at Sunderland, but they're the sorts of jobs he likes, and I'm sure, given the time, he'll do really well. And of course, he's brought in two players that you've played alongside, Stephen Pienaar and Victor Anichibi. He obviously played with Stephen for just probably about eight years, eight and a half years with his little uh, move to Spurs and back. And same again, Victor, four or five years. So two lads that I know really well, two lads that did really well for, for this club. 
well, they'll be out to obviously uh, get get one over on the old employer, and we need to make sure that doesn't happen. Just talking about the the Everton defence for a minute, Mason Holgate is is fitted seamlessly into uh, into the back four, back three, whichever we're we're playing. What has allowed him to do that? Um, I think the the obviously his own qualities first and foremost. Coming in, obviously everyone had a fresh start. Mason did really well pre-season, took took the chance he got. But also the players around him, I think um, the squad and the the lads help him settle in really well. Not only the, obviously the, you'd always talk about the senior lads help him out, but even the lads similar similar age that have come through um, last year, Brendan and, and and people like that, you know, help him sort of learn on the job and and explain you know what's required but you know character wise Mason's just took it all in his stride it's always easier when the team's playing well to, to come in and, and, and perform but you know he's he's been you know one of our top performers in the, in the first three games so not we were at the stadium of light last season back end of last season it was pretty dismal it's got to be better on Monday and probably will be yeah let's hope so uh, it can't be any worse than that does because we were tough doing commentary work mm. that night we were we were poor uh, didn't take many fans, and that's not like us. We were talking earlier in the show how well supported we are. Didn't take that many fans. Uh, and the result shown, it, it was a poor performance. David Moyes will be trying everything possibly uh, to beat us on Monday night, but we've got to go there. We're, we're looking fit, we're looking strong. I think we'll take the game to Sunderland as well. Uh, why not? Uh, let's go. Let's go out and attack them. Uh, we'll be solid because we we have got, as Kev mentioned, Ashley Williams. We've got Jags there, organisation. Gareth Barry just sitting in front. So we'll be strong defensively, but we'll have the players to hurt Sunderland. I feel. How good's Gareth Barry been, by the way, since he joined the football club, Kev? Well, you know, everybody's looking at who's going to be replacing him, but it's going to be a tough act there to replace that guy because he's been absolutely tremendous. You know the. The what he does, um, the way he gets it, the way he gives it. I think we've we we had a gem there. We've had an absolute steal from Manchester City, uh, and he and he's repaid. In bucket loads. Expecting a win Monday night. Um, it's going to be tough. I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to be positive. I think we've got off to a great start so far. So why not go up there and get all three points? Certainly one to look forward to. Well, David Moyes has already been an opposition manager against Everton three times. And he's lost all three, one with Preston and two with Manchester United. Ronald Koeman, though, certainly won't be taking Monday night's game at Sunderland lightly, but he's hoping that the team can carry on where they left off. Yeah, that, that, that will be great. Of course, it's all about uh, winning. But OK, I think if we improve in our performance in, in, in different aspects of football, then, then we have a good chance to win the game. And, uh, but OK, we know every Premier League game is a difficult one. Sunderland uh, also has uh, signed some some new players and the team will be different than it was two weeks ago. But uh, it's a strong team at home and uh, we need to be prepared for that. What have you made to, to their start to the season? They're still looking for their first league win, Sunderland. Yeah, I think they had, they had a good uh, result uh, in the last game against Southampton away. I think it was a good uh, to get a point out of that. and. Uh, OK, with the time who get the manager to, to do the trainings in the international duty and to get in some new players, some players who, were, who didn't play about uh, injuries. And, and OK, we will see what, what the team will be in, in front of us. With the way the fixtures have, have turned out, is it a positive that this game is being played on a Monday night and the fact that the lads who have been away on international duty have a few more days to recover? Yes, for this weekend, yes. Uh, normally, I don't like uh, to play on Monday because uh, football needs to play on, on Saturday and Sunday, but uh, in a weekend. But after this international duty, it's good to have uh, two days more than, than most of the teams because the preparation for the, for the next game is, is, is with more sessions uh, of training and that's always better for the team and for the players. Uh, and finally, coach, how's James McCarthy going on in his recovery from uh, an operation? Yeah, he had the surgery last Friday and uh, he's doing well. And normally the expectation that, that he will be back in, in two, two and a half weeks, uh, back to the team. And that's good. When you look at Sunderland, Kev, as to where the danger will come from, you can't look much further than Jermaine Defoe. No, you can't. He's a, he's a big asset to him, isn't he? And he, he kept them in the Premiership last year. Mm. Um, I think it's just his movement. His movement's fantastic and uh, his touch, you know, his touch is so, so close to him or close enough that he can actually, you know, touch and shoot straight away. His first touch is fantastic inside the box. Um, 
but he's running off the ball as well. He creates space for himself more often than not. He's playing up front on his own, but uh, he is definitely one to look look out for. And Sunderland will be wary of Romelu Lukaku, who scored a couple of goals in midweek. Hasn't yet scored for Everton this season, but one of those players I would think, Snows, once he gets one, he'll go on a roll. Yeah, now he's got off the mark. Uh, that'll be pleasing for his uh, national team. And now he's got to provide for us. Uh, I, I want to see Rom playing the last third uh, of the opponent's half. We've got players uh, that will sit there in midfield that will uh, pass the balls to him. Gareth Barry, for, for instance. Ross Barkley will be getting on there as well to... Kevin Morales out wide to get the balls in the box. So I want to see Rom predominantly in and around that 18-yard box. I don't want to see him dropping off Daz and mm. receiving balls and trying to link up play. Get Big Rom in the 18-yard in the box for me. Monday night could be a big night for Big Rom. It's gone quickly again, hasn't it, here? That's it for another Everton show. We're all off to the northeast for the game on Monday, which hopefully the Ronald Koeman bandwagon can keep on rolling. Full commentary, by the way, as ever, will be on evertonfc.com. Watch the telly, mute the sound and put me in snods on. That's the way to do it. Huge thanks to Kevin Ratcliffe for joining us this week. I'm sure you've all enjoyed the company of two Everton legends, or three, if we're counting snods. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll see you next week. <laughs>